a really cool after party scheduled. But uh, since I'm not going to make it, because as soon as I finish, I'm getting in a cab, going to the airport, and flying to Argentina. Um, I already started the party without you. But <laughs> when uh, at the end, uh, there might be some surprises with wine, so uh, just wait and see. So um, here to talk about Open Bino, tell you about the project and uh, play with some, some toys that we have here. So my name is Mike Barrow, and uh, I purchased a piece of land in 2003 in Mendoza, Argentina, to plant a vineyard and to start to make some organic wine. And you say, well, what does this have to do with uh, blockchain or SCC? But actually, you'll see that my background is uh, in IT, working in uh, the data center space in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, and still today. But uh, I decided to get in this completely different area out of uh, my league, which was making organic wine in Argentina. So how difficult could that be? And very quickly, because I have no idea what I'm doing at that time, um, it becomes apparent a lot of different issues and uh, this massive learning curve about making wine, about selling wine, um, about growing grapes, all of the three different aspects of this business uh, that uh, I think you'll see actually are really interesting real world applications uh, for a lot of the tools and developments and things that we're seeing here at the conference. So. Uh, so I think this is a good real-world example for cryptocurrency, for crypto assets, for blockchain. And basically it revolves around three different issues that as I'm starting to take my first bottles into the market, um, basically going from, India, or from Argentina to India uh, to Brazil, coming to Europe, and uh, pouring my first bottles and thinking, okay, this is going to be fun, people are going to buy this very easily, and with the concept that the better the, your wine is, the better your product is, the more expensive it is, the better price you're going to get. Well, wine is actually a very interesting product, and I say it is the best metaphor that we have for crypto assets or cryptocurrency. And the reason is that it's the best metaphor for a crypto asset is because a bottle of wine in itself has a very elastic price. You can have a 2 euro wine and you can have a 20,000 euro wine. Um, and the price depends on a whole number of factors. Quality is certainly one of them, but the story behind it, the scarcity, the rarity, um, the reviews, the comments, the, the, the feedback on point systems and prizes and um, influencers and all these other things. And yet the cost of producing a 20,000 euro wine or a 2 euro wine is actually not that, that different. Right? Um, so uh, really a bottle of wine is emblematic of this object that has no intrinsic value on its own. It's a piece of glass. But that represents a shared value, this shared fictitious value, much like fiat does. Right. So that's the, the first thing when I started making wine, the first vintage I had was 2007. Uh, one of the questions was, well, what's the price of your wine and how do you justify that? Right. In some places it would be too expensive for their shops, in some places it was too inexpensive. They said, we only deal with wines in a certain category. Um, so I was kind of at a loss to how to set uh, the, the value, valuation for the product. The second question that really comes up a lot also is I found myself doing presentations to wine people, to wine shops, to restaurant owners, to drinkers, and uh, telling them the story. I said, look, I make an organic product. Uh, the wine is called MTB, Mike Tango Bravo. Uh, it's Malbec, Petit Verdot, Cabernet Sauvignon. It's uh, giving them the description of the product and saying, you know, we only uh, pick uh, 60, 50, 60 percent of the grapes, the rest we throw on the ground. Uh, we do organic, we're fair trade, we treat everybody well, we try to do, put a lot of love into this product. 
And then I thought, well, who doesn't say that? Who doesn't say some version of that? What winery doesn't give you um, this story about how they are so perfect at doing things? And yet, uh, there's a lot of lies in the marketing behind products like wine and like every product, but especially wine. And one of the reasons that uh, there is this, this huge gap between authenticity, what actually happens in the vineyard and in a winery, and what wineries sell to customers, has to do a, a little bit about the mythology that they create in people's minds. So if you are a, a brewer, like a big, you know, Heineken, Stella Artois, any of these brands, and you say, you know, we did 20 million liters this week, uh, we're number one in Europe and the region, and that, those are really powerful selling points to be big. The bigger, the better, right? But in the wine business, to say we did 50 million bottles last year is detrimental to a brand because that's, you're not thinking about an industrial process in wines, and bigger wineries, uh, through necessity, have this industrial process. Now, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing, but the fact that they're... They don't tell that story. They tell the, you know, the family the, from the 1860s that planted these grapes and are very meticulous about taking care of it. And that has absolutely nothing to do uh, with reality. So the point I'm getting at here is that there is a value for small producers that actually are doing what we imagine when we think of this locally grown, uh, very artisanal process. If we have a way to communicate the authenticity of our claims, right? If we are completely transparent or build extreme transparency, yet we have some mechanism, non-repudiation, to, to show these claims and share them with our customers. There's a second element that has a lot to do with certifications. So today there's organic certifications, there's biodynamic certifications, there's fair trade, there's a thousand different stickers that you can put on the back of your bottle. All of them cost money, cost quite a bit for the certifiers to give you their, uh, their stamp of approval. And yet, they're also very easy to fake, right? So next week, um, I have my organic certifier coming. They come once a year. They sit down, and they say, uh, have a coffee or mate or a glass of wine or something. They say, OK, uh, Mike, did you spray any pesticides in the vineyard this year, right? Nope. Um, OK, share us a print out of the log of work log that you did last year and make sure that your practices are up to snuff, right? It's something that I probably scrapped together the night before if I didn't have it all ordered, right? Okay, now show us a receipt of stuff that you bought that you use in the vineyard that doesn't include anything that is not allowed, right? So obviously you wouldn't show anything prohibited and they say, okay, fine, pay us and you get another year's of certification. That's how organic certification works, right? And, but that is so far from what people imagine of an inspector coming in on surprise and taking leaves and dirt samples and, and doing all this chemistry to say, aha, you're using glyphosate or you're using some of these you know, things that we don't want to have in our food. Um, so it's extremely easy to treat, uh, to cheat. And I think, well, if I'm producing all this data every day, can't I just make a hash of this information or write directly to blockchain and say, here's all of my information. I can produce 10,000 data points a day rather than your one annual visit to say, which I could easily lie about. And my neighbors do, and other wineries do, because it's easy to fake, and say, no, I'm actually organic, but I'm proving it. So there's a transparency element and a non-repudiation element that's really interesting, I think. The third thing... So that's the question of price, question of transparency. But the third question has to do with uh, traceability. Now, there's a lot of talk about how to use uh, blockchain for traceability in uh, supply chain and shipping and all these other things. I'm not really focused on that. My interest is, you know, a bottle of wine leaves the winery, a case of wine, a pallet, and it goes somewhere, and I might know oh, that those water bottles are going to Buenos Aires, these are going to Barcelona, and those are going to Bombay. But I don't know who's drinking them. And I don't know what they think about it. And I don't know what in conditions they're drinking it. Are they drinking it alone? Are they at a party? 
Uh, are they having a good time? Are they uh, drinking with food? What are they eating? I mean, there's just a thousand uh, thoughts that come into your mind when you put all this effort into it and say, well, somebody's drinking it. I hope they enjoy it. I think, well, there must be some way that we could get to the person's mind, to the thoughts that occur afterwards, um, by contacting them and asking them questions. Right? So that's kind of an tr uh, intraceability, what I like to call vine, wine, dine, mind. Right? Going from the vines to the wine to the table to people's thoughts. So those are the three questions as I start this on this journey, uh, winemaking process, and completely naive about this whole thing. And of course, this overlaps with the, the journey that we're seeing here in blockchain, and in the time span at least. And so the, I say, that, well, there's a lot of really interesting tools that could be applied to these specific problems. So for the transparency part, Basically, what we do is uh, four different data sources. So the first is sensors, sensors first in the vineyard. And we're constantly looking at what sensors we'll put into the winery in different places. But basically, we have a set of IoT sensors that are uh, called Vinduino. This is an invention uh, uh, from California, a friend in California. And he's created this Vinduino boards, which basically it's an Arduino with some uh, humidity sensors, a solar panel, a battery, a uh, low rock configuration uh, for radio that, that, tests, uh, that measures uh, soil humidity, and we do it at two meters underground, one meter, half a meter in surface. So Mendoza in Argentina is a desert, and so water use is very important. Right? So if I'm water irrigating, I want to know how far down this water is percolating to the roots. And that's going to have an impact on the quality of the wine. Um, and to that, we add uh, weather sensors, you know, wind direction, wind speed, um, sunlight, temperature, uh, relative pressure, all of these different things. Collect them in the sensors and publish this data um, on the web. But previous to that, we've created some smart contracts that basically write the data directly to a smart contract on the side chain. Now, what's the point of using this for weather data? Is it really important to use a blockchain? No. But if my objective here, starting this year, is to say, I'm not paying any more for organic certification. I want to have all this, certif this data available and so I can say, look, I'm following all the norms for organic, and here's the data which I couldn't have manipulated afterwards. So that's the, the beginning with the IoT sensors and uh, data for the environment. And you can add things like pH sensors, uh, acidity, uh, CO2 sensors in the, in the winery, temperature, uh, lots of other things. The second element is the work log, the bitacora. And this is uh, basically just collecting and categorizing what is the work that goes into the vineyard every day and into the winery, into the business. So we want to be able to say, today on Thursday, uh, we are culling uh, or pruning or harvesting or whatever it is we're doing for in Malbec from the rows 36 to 52, and have a way to describe this process to, uh, as, as a didactic approach so that our consumers or anybody else could say, OK, this is actually what goes into the day-to-day -day making of these grapes and this wine and create a, a sort of a run book of operations and measure how much of the human effort goes into it, right? We want to be able to say to somebody, this bottle of wine had X number of hours doing these types of tasks, X hours doing this. This is how much human effort and sweat went into making this. The third element, and maybe the most important one, is the business aspect. And this is taking our accounting data from an a open source ERP platform called Open Bravo, and being able to publish this and saying, this is how much it cost us for the glass, for the bottle, for the label, for the cork, uh, for the taxes, for salaries, everything that went into it, shipping, um, marketing, and all these other aspects. And so then we can also share how much we've received from different markets and basically be completely naked in front of the world 
and say, this is how the actual business works. Now, that might seem counterintuitive to a lot of people to share your secrets. But if you're a medium size or a large size enterprise, your secrets are actually worth something, potentially. Like how much they manage to leverage the price of the bottle or make a deal with the, the box manufacturer or whatever. I'm a small producer. None of my data is interesting to anybody from a secretive point of view. Like I know already that I'm paying the highest price for all of the products that I buy based on the volume. And so I can, how, however, do something that they can't do, which is share this information with the world, with the customers, and say, here's what goes into a bottle of wine. You know, at most, if I'm paying 15 pesos for a box, my another box manufacturer go, well, it's, you're paying too much, but I'll do it for 14, right? Why not? So there's a real, uh, I think we underestimate the value of the transparency that we talk about so much, um, especially when you're talking about uh, blockchain. Well, how can we actually monetize that if you're a company and use this as part of your communications with your customers say, there is the data, this is how much we paid. So if you add those up and add images, 360 uh, degree cameras doing time lapse, and publish these directly to a side chain, uh, do a hash of this data points, then I can say, look, I'm organic, I'm fair trade, whatever certification I want to claim to have, as long as I'm following it, and my reputation is based on that. This is the extreme transparency that we look at taking a traditional company, traditional winery, and turning it into an open source winery. So that's the first question of transparency, telling the truth. The second question has to do with uh, the valuation of the product. And so what we've done here is not something terribly com complex from a technical aspect, but it is uh, complex from a business aspect. And how it works is, we harvest the grapes. So in Argentina, being in South America, we harvest end of March, early April. Um, like I said, I'm flying back tonight. I think this year we'll probably harvest like the first of April, first, second, third in those days. Harvest the grapes, take them in the winery, ferment the grapes, do all the processes to turn grape juice into a lovely alcoholic liquid. And then we basically have wine but that wine needs to sit for at least three years before it's nice enough to drink, right? However, by the 6th of May, we know how much wine is in uh, that particular vintage. And so based on that, we can uh, do an, uh, an ICO, let's call it that, of ERC20 tokens, which are equivalent to the number of bottles, and put them out for sale based initially at cost price. So we've already done this two years. This will be our third year. And 2018, we did the first wine-backed crypto asset. Uh, essentially, we calculated that we're going to have 16,384 bottles, right, 2 to the 14th. And we issued 16,384 ERC-20 tokens called MTB, after the name of the wine, 18. MTB 18 is the token. So we run the ICO from the 6th of May to the 25th of July every year. And after that, we go on to the exchange. Now, initially, we were working uh, with a centralized exchange. But just very recently, and actually, this is something that uh, we're presenting here today, we did a fork of Unisox, which is the front end for Uniswap that they did to, to showcase how you could take a specific product, like socks, right? I have one because it's a unisock. The other one's from Orchid downstairs. So how you could take sock, uh, something like unisocks, fork it. And so we have uh, Viniswap, which is our open vino dot exchange. And so now you can go onto the exchange and buy for a ridiculously low price the tokens that correspond to uh, these two vintages, the 2018 and 2019. On the 25th of July, we'll have the, 20, the MTB20 token, and like that every year. The idea here is not to create a $10,000 wine or even a $1,000 wine. The idea here is to allow 
the marketplace to define the value of the valuation of the token and therefore the valuation of the wine. And what's really interesting here, if it's not already obvious, is that because it's backed by a delicious elixir, this, this wine, there's going to be a floor and there's going to be a ceiling for the token. Right? So the token can tank tomorrow, but it's not going to get to one cent because our traditional buyers, importers, distributors, restaurants, shops that we're already selling to, are going to have to buy like everybody else to do tokenization. Right? So if the price of Ether goes down, or people go and sell off their tokens and it drops down, all I have to do is talk to my importer in Brazil and say, hey, you know, you can get the wine for 50 cents, let's say. Or let's see the corollary. Now it's $500 a token. Well, you say, listen, I've tried Mike's wine. I think it's good, but I don't think it's worth $500. Or put the figure you want to put, right? That's what we're trying to do is when I want to be able to get to the point where the variability of the price depends on uh, the phase and the life cycle of wine. It shouldn't cost the same the day it's fermented to the day it's drinkable to the day it's at its peak to the day there's a scarce number of bottles or maybe there's been some bad press or good press or whatever, right? Let's let that float and use a decentralized exchange or exchanges to set that price. But I want to get to the point where if somebody asks me, what's the price of your wine? I say, I don't know. Let's look up online and see what it is. Right? So we do uh, this ICO. We want to try to sell 75% of the tokens, at least, or at the most, I should say. Uh, we need to keep 25% or so um, in case you know a pallet falls over in the cold storage and breaks, or I drink too much at home or whatever, I need to be able to replace these, um, burn these tokens for myself. Now, the last stage is once the wine's available, basically through our e-commerce site, the only currency that we're going to accept is these tokens that you had to get on the secondary market, um, and we'll do the fulfillment. And at that point, we'll actually say, OK, you give us a token, we'll give you the bottle of wine. Where is this wine going? Oh, it's going to Buenos Aires, or it's going to Paris, or it's going to Delhi. At this point, I have to charge you the shipping and handling for this, um, which introduces a really unique element here, because um, I don't know where the tokens end up, ended up. You could be in Saudi Arabia and have the tokens and say, send me the wine. I say, well, it's $10,000 a bottle because we have to do contraband, right? Um, but in, re in most markets, this means it'll actually be much cheaper than if you had bought it through any other mechanism. Why? Because the price that I can declare for the export to the importer that's actually moving the physical product is that based at cost, right? So if my cost is the basis, that's what, and I have a reason for specifying that because again, the wealth is changing. The valuation could be changing up or down in the secondary market. So the, so the amount of tax that's associated with that will be much less. Now, why this is interesting is if you think about different markets, here in Europe, it's not so difficult, or in the US, maybe you have a two or three uh, X amount of tax on top of imported alcohol. But in a place like Brazil, it might be seven X, seven times the value. In a place like India, it's up to 10 times. So a $5 bottle of wine uh, exported from Argentina in a restaurant in Delhi could easily be $100. Right, hundred, hundred and fifty dollars, but in that range, and so, and most of that is because of excise and duties and tax. Right, so the lower you can have a justification without breaking laws, without circumventing, without doing a double invoicing, that's where this is is really interesting, from all kinds of other ways. Um, aside from that, we're also doing the first. Next month, we're doing the first export, of wine from Argentina to Uruguay as a as a trial and having our export invoice paid either in, probably in DAI uh, or, in, or in BTC, right? So the third element, I said we had the price, the tokenization, the, the question about transparency, and the third question has to do with what people think when they're drinking it, how do they feel about it, and what situation they're drinking it. 
So we do this by a thing called you drink it, you own it. And basically what it means is when the 2018 bottles become available next year on the 6th of May, what we'll be doing is including information on the back label that you can scan it, download an app, and the app will ask you for your name, address, age, information about you, maybe even a tax ID number, to do a selfie with the bottle, and answer four, five, six questions about your experience drinking that bottle. So we're going to be able to gather quite a lot of information about who's actually drinking it. But of course, that's incredibly invasive, time consuming. I'm asking you to take time and sit there and answer all these questions. So why would you do that? Well, you don't have to. It's completely optional. Most people won't. But if you do it, we'll issue a token that is backed by or represents legally one share of the company. So now you've gone from being a consumer to being a partner. You own the liquid in the glass. And so now I ask you, what do you think about your wine, our wine? Um, so this is the concept of you, you drink it, you own it. How can we flip the relationship between us with the consumer uh, to incorporate them? And the way I like to think about it is if you are drinking the wine, you're putting it into your body already, right? You're provoking some thoughts, maybe burning some brain cells. Whatever you're doing, you're actually already making a pretty substantial commitment to this product. So I'm just saying, since you've done that, if you've given me some feedback about it, I'll make you part of the experience, own a share of the company, right? So this all, all opens up all kinds of really cool and interesting options, such as, uh, not only is it the dividends or voting rights or traditional things like that, but we can do a gamification. So now we can ask you, since you we're partners now, and by the way, we know who you are, we've done a KYC. And if you've lied on any of the information, that's fine, but your shares aren't going to be valid. right? So we've done a KYC, and now we're asking you, do you want to play a game? And the game can be... Uh, We've, the, our game was based on five different categories. So you can play to be a viticulturist, somebody that grows grapes. You can be an enologist, somebody that makes wine, a sommelier, right, wine taster, wine merchant, part of the business. Or you can play to be an IoT uh, blockchain person in this scheme. And it's a didactic game where we teach you little snippets of information about winemaking or growing grapes or these different things. But periodically, you'll get a question. And the question will be, uh, could be a wine trivia type of question. But as much as possible, we want the questions to be to derived from data that we're generating in the vineyard, or in the winery, or in the business. So if the, quest the question could be, should we irrigate the Malbec grapes today? Right, and why? Well, the only way you could answer that uh, would be to go and look at the sensor data. So now you've learned a little bit about water usage in the vineyard. Um, you become a Turk machine for our data, validating actually looking at the sensors, because that's one of the hard issues. Like You can push all this data out there, who's going to look at it and why? And if you answer the question properly, you get some points. If you don't answer properly, you lose points. Or if you don't answer at all, you lose points, right? And at the end of the year, when we do our cycle of the vintage token, we can take, set aside 10% of our wine vintage tokens and give them to the game players proportionally to how many points that they have. Right? So now you're learning about wine, you're making money or you know, earning tokens that you can sell on exchange, or you can drink the bottles, you can resell the bottles, and we're partners. And how else, I mean, what better brand ambassador could you have than that? So this is the concept of drink it, you drink it, you own it, flipping the relationship with the customer. And going, like I said, from the concept of the vine to the wine to the table and to people's minds and getting this information. So <laughs> once you start doing this, there's all kinds of really cool things that you can do. And like I said, 
the data that we're collecting today in the vineyard and the winery, um, we're writing to a side chain because of the cost of doing it in mainnet, obviously. And we're looking at ways to do that, uh, to make that, that more visible. Well, one of the things we want to do is we've built a prototype. Um, I don't have one here with me, but basically what we've done is taken a wine bottle, cut it in half, put a Raspberry Pi 4 inside of it with some sensors, a speaker, some lights, and a digital ink uh, display, so it looks like a label. And providing this, we're rolling this out next month to wine shops in Argentina and Brazil, where they're selling the wine already. And say, this is your, your, your token, your device, that for me it's an advertising point, because it's, it's branded and everything. But basically it allows them to do a couple things. By having a temperature and light sensor, they can measure the, uh, the ambient conditions of the wine shop, right? And one of the selling points of a wine shop over supermarkets that they can't really compete with on price is to say, we look after our product, right? We keep it at a good condition, good temperature. Now they would have a way to prove that and say, this, this device here, this funky looking bottle with electronics inside of it is actually auditing the shop. And it's part of this new thing called the blockchain. <laughs> Right? And it's also validating data from this vineyard, could be other vineyards. Um, it's earning a few tokens of wine bottles every year. And it's a point of sale device so that they can validate transactions if they're charging, if they're an al allowing them to, uh, to receive payment in, in any kind of crypto for their other products. Right? Um, and it's a speaker to listen to Venophonics. So this is the concept of a Vina block. It's how we can make our, our sidechain decentralized truly, each one in a very heterogeneous fashion, because each one of these are independent mom and pop shops, mostly, that um, have their own internet connect connection. And all we need to do is give them this device, configure it for them, and now they're a part of, uh, they're running an actual node that's doing stuff that's useful to them, and it's useful for us to get the word out. So another cool thing, once you've got all of this uh, data that you're collecting, like I said, one of the problems with collecting data, especially environmental data, is like who's looking at it, right? And so I thought, well, since we've got all this data points, we should do something artistic or something that really helps extend breaking this uh, as a metaphor for understanding how this all works, how it all glues together. So we built this device called Venophonics. Now, I brought part of it here, but essentially what this is, it's a hand-built analog synthesizer. The back part is based on the design of an ARP 2600, which is a synthesizer from 1971. Um, it's open source design now. Um, they've done some reissues recently by Korg and Behringer and these uh, different uh, synthesizer manufacturers. So it's completely analog, me meaning that you're manipulating voltages to make sounds. And what we did is created this uh, Vinophonics, which has a blockchain switch. Uh, it's running a Raspberry Pi inside as a geth node. It has an Arduino Mega and some other basic off-the-shelf stuff. And what this does is it reads the data from the vineyard through the blockchain and allows us to manipulate these sliders here, these 16 sliders, to manipulate whatever the sound is that we happen to be running. Right? Now the patch, which is the way it's cabled, and the configuration, um, we can do and change that as much as we want. But what's really cool about modular synthesizers like this is you can set up a configuration such that it actually goes into this really long kind of extended loop of making uh, these soundscapes. And if you could introduce some chaos into it, some modifications, then it makes it something that's really a, a, a sound source on its own. And so the idea here is mapping these sliders to the temperature to uh, wind direction, wind speed, uh, rainfall, these sorts of things. 
So you can imagine that this slider here will map to the temperature in the vineyard. And so that's going to be kind of a sine wave mostly, right? It's cold at night, hot in the day, and this is going to move back and forth because these are motorized sliders. So that's what I've got here. And as you can see, we can give it a try. If I can find the, oh, here it is. All right, so all right, so this is just an oscillator that uh, could be easily mapped to anything. Let's see, that works. Okay. Great. So right now it's it's offline. To see if it works. And so, let's see. All right, so let's see if this works. Go Vineyard. I don't know if you can see that, but all of these sliders are now autonomous. And basically, we'll get the data from the blockchain and revert to whatever position. So I can do different things and play with this. And I can do it in a local mode if I'm doing a performance and then say, OK, let's play along with the vineyard and change other elements, patches, uh, you know. Does anybody have perfect pitch? I think that's like a la 440. Uh, no. Now. Really necessary, right? Now you might be asking yourself, yeah, but that's, I don't, that's horrible music. It's not uh, really good music. And to that, I have three things to tell you. Uh, first of all, this is not the whole instrument. This is the controller. It does have a couple of oscillators, so we can make some sound, but there's other pieces missing. The second thing is, um, I just put this together, and so I really don't know how to use it yet. I haven't figured out the musicality aspect of it. Um, flying back to Argentina, uh, tonight, we'll figure it out, and uh, this will be streaming venophonics.com or venophonics.ar 24-7, so if you want to listen to it. Um, the third thing is, maybe you need to question your judgment about music and, and have a more open mind. And it's not just me, right? This is actually could be something that you get addicted to and listen to every day. Um, and so, what we want to also do later on is in the app, allow the... Uh, people that are registered in the app, our partners, our shareholders, to be able to move the sliders, you know, to manipulate it, to play with the vineyard. Uh, the vineyard would re override it every three minutes, but you can modify it and play along with the vineyard. So that's Vinophonics. And like I say, then you start to get into other areas and you think, well, what else could I do with all this information? So. Recently, I uh, started working with a startup out of Oxford, super cool, called Verivan, Verivin. Um, and they are uh, physicists that basically have built a Raman non-invasive spectrometer, right? This is a device that's a little bit bigger than Vinophonics, looks like a, you know, like a printer scanner size thing. And what this device allows you to do is uh, scan a bottle, analyze a bottle of wine without un taking the cork out, right? Without extracting any liquid from the bottle. So essentially, you put a bottle of wine into this machine, close the cover, and it has a laser and an array of sensors that will detect, will measure the absorption and refraction of light 
and come back to you and give you a Vino print, a fingerprint, a digital fingerprint of the contents. Now, um, at this point, it's a, it's a prototype device. It's only been in existence a couple of months. But since I had to bottle the 2018, the MTB18 uh, bottles this year, and in October, 18th of October, what we did is I bottled the 16,384 bottles that I talked about, put those aside in cold storage. But we took uh, 512 bottles and bottled it in four different types of glass. Transparent, two different color green bottles, and a brown bottle. And built this, this rack of 512 bottles with infrared, green, ultraviolet, uh, warm, neutral, and cold white light with different LED arrays, temperature controlled, same cork, same wine, same everything. What changes is the light and the diff four different types of bottles in each set. So what we want to see here is the effect of what's called light strike. Like does light, uh, we know that light will oxidize wine. The question is what kind of light and why does it have to be in a green bottle, right? Why do we put wine in a green bottle? Well, that's a traditional thing, and everybody says, oh, because it protects itself from the light. Does it really? What light, and what about other types of glass? So we did a baseline, measured all the bottles, put the bottles in the rack. We'll do our second one in May. Uh, we'll also open some, do some blind tastings, those types of things. And this is about uh, learning, just a science experiment about wine. We've also bottled 128 bottles with a screw cap, a synthetic cork, natural cork, conglomerate cork. And uh, so it's a science experiment. But, also, but mostly what we want to find out is, OK, if I want to map a wine asset, not just the whole vintage, but maybe an NFT, right? Uh, what is the noise that I have to eliminate so that if I put it into a machine like this, I can always go, yep, that's a, that, I don't have a label. Um, I don't know what the label says, I don't care, but I know that's inside of that bottle is this particular wine, right? It could be my wine, it could be a really expensive wine from the 1940s, whatever it is. Um, what's valuable is to be able to identify that and associate this with the value uh, crypto asset. So this is what... Uh, Radivine is about. And it's a pretty cool way if you think about it. There's a lot of fraud that happens today um, in the wine world. It's a really, it's a beautiful crime to commit if you're selling uh, really old bottles because people don't open them. And so they can just pass from hand to hand and have this incredible value associated with them. And yet it could be completely fake inside. That's one thing. The second thing is, if you spent 10,000 euros on a bottle of wine and said, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to open it and we're going to drink this tonight, um, you probably, you might not know what that bottle's supposed to taste like. So you don't know if you, you've been screwed or not. Um, if you did open it and you did recognize that this is a fake, are you going to tell your guests, I was an idiot and I just paid $10,000 for this bottle of wine? Probably not, or maybe so. And if you did decide to sit, come clean and say, you know what, I know that I, didn't, I got robbed and this was a fraud, what are you going to do? Because you bought it from somebody who bought it from somebody who brought it from somebody. And they have, they say, I don't know, that's, I thought it was real. Um, you know, so that's, that's why it's a, an interesting uh, thing to deal with. Also, imagine that you know, you're a wine buyer in India or in China and you come to my place. And I open up a bottle and offer you a taste, and you think, oh, that's really good. OK, let's, I want to buy you know, X amount. And we start negotiating a price, and we come to a deal. And I say, fine, let's do the paperwork, and I'll get everything underway. It's probably going to be, at best, four, to month, four months, maybe six months before you get your first shipment, because of all the, the logistics involved. Now, you're sitting in your wine shop in, uh, in Delhi, in Beijing, and you get this. And you open a few bottles and you go, is that the stuff that I had that day at Mike's place? Or did he send me something else? Right? Now, I wouldn't do that. But if you had a mechanism, even if you didn't use it, right, 
that you knew you could verify it, and you don't have to rely on your memory of that. Or you can verify that, yeah, it's the same wine, but it's set in a port in Jebel Ali in Dubai or in Singapore at 50 degrees and it's cooked, right? That you could somehow check that without opening all, you know, every, you could open a few boxes, take the bottles out, but not uncork it and get that conclusion, right? So there's all kinds of really interesting applications for this. So this is an open source project, uh, OpenBino. We've got everything published on our wiki. Uh, all the information is there. Um, OpenBino Exchange is our token exchange. Um, and if you follow us and tweet something out now, today, I'll send you, and you send me a message to, on our Telegram group of OpenVino. Uh, my uh, personal Telegram is Mike Tango Bravo, one word. Um, I'll send you a token so you can have your first wine-backed crypto asset. Um, and to that, are there any questions? Thank you very much. Yes. I think, wait, wait, they're going to get you a microphone. Um, first, I have to say that I love the idea of breaking open source to winemaking because I, I, I love both worlds. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Um, if you don't matter, I will talk first. I will drink after. No, that's fine. Yeah, that's your uh, reward for the. Okay. <laughs> so. I'm going to turn I, this off just because. I don't want any black okay. smoke if I didn't, okay. you know. Yeah. Um, and especially in this idea, I like the fact to bring together in the same boat the winemaker and the people who will enjoy it. First to link them with all those data you shared mm. and then to bring them on board by sharing some share of the company. Wow. Yeah. But my question is how you do that? Um, do you plan to release some security token or is it like real share or so I'm just wondering on the how yeah okay so it's a token uh, let's call it a security token because in fact it is a security right but uh, three points about that uh, first of all we're doing this all in Argentina we're not doing it in Malta we're not doing it in Gibraltar it's in Argentina it's a corporation in Argentina that I'm publishing all the taxes I'm paying, I'm collecting VAT every time I sell a token during the ICO, right? And I'm, so I'm giving all this information, I'm talking to Argentine regulators, I'm saying, look, if we're not legal, then show me who is. That's the first thing. Second thing is, we are doing this extended KYC as part of the process, because that's the whole point of, of, you know, if you're gonna play the game with us later, and then you're gonna cheat, which you might find a way to cheat, um, it's much less of an incentive if you are a known entity in this pool of uh, people, right? So basically what we'll issue is you a token and then that token we can get your personal data and change the legal status of the company to represent those shares um, and basically track the wallets that those tokens are in. If they change wallets, then we'll say, okay, who does it own, who's it owned by now, right? Because we need to do that adjustment. So. Technically, it's not at all complicated. It's more of a complicated question of uh, how to do it legally and how to facilitate the change. Now, Argentina recently has an uh, electronic uh, books for shareholders in the company, so it's, you can do it online digitally. It's much easier. Um, but that's actually the difficult part. There's no technical challenge of doing this. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering, you're selling your wine at cost at the end of the day, or isn't, wouldn't it be more interesting to, um, to sell it with a margin? So, very good question. Um, <laughs> so, the, uh, the question of the, the valuation is, like I said, we are issuing the tokens at cost. Um, we are keeping some of the tokens to sell later because of, you know, in case of loss or breakage, or because I drink a lot, I need to keep some. But uh, that doesn't, and so there can be some value gained there. There's value created in the liquidity pool for Viniswap. But there's no requirement that we always sell at cost. 
right? That's how we're doing it in the first years. But we can do cost plus X. I didn't want to start with some arbitrary price in the beginning because then I'm going back to you, myself inventing the price, right? But it doesn't mean that we always have to do it at cost. So I think we have time for one last question. Okay. Anybody? Should I pour this last glass or nobody? Uh. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, this is this is your this is the only ID to for for this industry. I mean, this is great because there's you have. Thank you very much. <laughs> you are raising a lot of questions, a lot of concern, as much for producers and consumers, wine lovers. I mean, a lot of things, and even me, musicians. I love the project. But um, uh, are you, so you are the only one doing this. Are you not afraid, like some like big massive wine corporation is gonna take this ID and just switch it out? Um, so, so yeah, we are the only ones. But you have to understand, first of all, the wine industry is super traditional. Uh, secondly, because of the, 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 you know, that it's so recent, they're so new, the tools that we're doing this with, right? I mean, this is the third year for this conference. I've come every year. It's wonderful. I love it. But we all know how much alpha, beta stuff there is in this. And wine, if you're a winery that you uh, are successful in making money with your wine today, do you really want to tokenize all of it and take this leap, which is what I'm doing, right? So... Uh, it, it's, it's a risk just because of it's new, new. Now, wineries come to me and they say, hey, we'd like to do that. Uh, how do we do it? And I say, well, you can go to the wiki. You can go to our website. You can download all this information. We were on you know, GitHub. There's our code. Um, and there, but if I were you, I would wait a couple of years and see what, how we tweak it, what works, what doesn't. Um, it's all free. If you want me to help you, I'd be more than happy to. It's quite expensive. Um, that's, you know, maybe there's a business. I, so I guess really I don't have the, the answer of how this scales. I can tell you that the reception, even in the wine world, is really positive about this. So, and yes, you can apply this to coffee, you can apply it to cacao, you can apply it to other things where you're not dealing with the bare commodity, right? If it's traded in Chicago, it doesn't work for this. But if there's something that changes over the life cycle of the valuation, you can do this. Thank you. So. Okay, thank you very much. So. Uh, if you want, there is a, the end speech in the main theater, and there is a picture also, I think. <laughs> <laughs>